calls me to order. The city of San Clemente respects the many people of different faiths who reside here. The city council historically begins its session with an invocation offered by one of the religious leaders of our community with full appreciation of our shared belief that we are one nation under God. And while the city cannot endorse any particular religion, we respect the religious freedom and freedom of expression of all our citizens to pray as they feel led to pray. This evening's invocation will be given by Mrs. Robin Margraff of Our Lady of Fatima Church. Or not. Or not. Lou, you want to give an invocation? No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, anybody want to raise their hand? Yeah, but he would raise his okay. hand. Okay, there you go. Pamela's going to give it, and then uh, please remain standing for Mr. Schwartz is going to lead us in the pledge. In the, in the name of the I am that I am, in the name of my holy Christ self, I call for the blessing of this council chamber's meeting. Today, I, I, I ask that they all be blessed with, with peace and, and those things that they give to us so freely and one-pointedly. I, I call that it go out into the world and envelop the world and bring all of her children home and and so that they can recognize the peace and the healing that happens only in this village, our San Clemente village, San Clemente, California, zip code 92672. Thank you, dear Lord, for this council chambers. They can do no wrong. They they have led us like like uh, the, an offshoot of the Oval Office right here made local. In, in the name of the I am that I am, in the name of my Holy Christ self, in Jesus' name, thank you, dear Lord, for this, our prayer, the Lord's prayer we love. Councilmember Swartz. Here. Councilmember Here. Ward. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Ham. Here. And Councilmember Donchak and Mayor Brown are absent. First item on the agenda is a toll road update. We don't have any additional detail here. Uh, okay. I have something that I can announce. Uh, the City of San Clemente, we're going to be holding a toll road forum on October 25th at the Presbyterian Church from 6 to 8 p.m., and a press release will be following, but I just wanted to get that word out. That's it. Steve, anything? No. Okay. No uh, cards? Okay. And uh, Mr. Terrence Hughes has requested that the next item on the agenda, the Boys and Girls Club report, be deferred to the council meeting of October 2nd. Members of the audience who wish to address council on matters that are within the jurisdiction of the City of San Clemente, but not separately listed on the agenda, may do so during the oral communications portion of the meeting. A total time limitation of 30 minutes is allocated for oral communications part one, with each speaker being allotted three minutes in which to give his or her presentation. And I have two cards. Okay, if you could step right up. Our first person is uh, Tyler Bowden, followed by Tyler will be Matt Willis. Hello, Council. I uh, hope you're doing well. I just wanted to uh, come in, and, and uh, I haven't been to a Council meeting in a while and, and wasn't able to make it to some meetings in the past where people have come up and spoken about uh, community choice energy. But uh, it's my first opportunity to get here to do so, and I just really wanted to come in and express my support um, as a community member uh, for community choice energy. Uh, we've seen it in effect in uh, various different municipalities around the state, and it's been very successful so far. Um, not only in reducing rates for rate payers in uh, each given community, but also in raising funds for uh, the respective cities that, uh, that they're serving. And uh, it's, a, it's a great way for um, rate payers or municipalities, a city like our own, to choose where energy is coming from instead of leaving it to investor-owned utilities, but also choosing how much the energy costs instead of leaving it to investor-owned utilities. Uh, those utilities... Uh, typically charge between an 8 to 10% margin on the, the power that they send and deliver to the ratepayers, 
And uh, as a city municipality, as a community choice um, aggregator, we would have the ability to choose what that margin is. And of course, with any business, there has to be some amount of margin to maintain um, and maybe even profit somewhat. But the beauty of community choice energy is that profit goes right back into the city and we get to decide what to do with it, whether to lower rates even further, whether to invest in renewable projects in the city to then offset future costs, or even to, to invest in other city programs and projects that we, we want to do. So um, I'd just like to express my support for community choice energy. And really the next step for us is, is to um, engage in a feasibility study for that. And um, I know we're in an election season right now. So it's kind of heated. There's a lot of different topics to talk about. I'm not sure if this council would want to engage in a feasibility study before the election, but um, it would be very timely, and, and I know that we wouldn't regret it. So thank you for your time. Thanks for your time. James, when are you going to be coming back, or staff going to be coming back with that report? Probably not until November. Okay. Yeah. So it won't be a feasibility study. It'll be asking council for next steps. More informational, correct? More informational. Yep. Uh, Mr. Wills? And Mr. Willis is our last speaker for oral communications. Hi, Council. Um, Matt Willis here, resident as of uh, about a year ago, energy consultant myself, and uh, here to kind of back up what Tyler just mentioned with my support for community choice aggregation or energy, whichever one you want to call it. It's good to hear that we're getting a report done. Uh, thank you guys for that. Um, realistically speaking, putting the Putting the choice of energy back in the hands of the people is what CCAs are about. And from a technical perspective, from an organizational perspective, it's something that once if we establish the boards, the correct boards, the legislative boards and everything else to build the CCA out and get it in front of the CPUC and get it in front of the PU, uh, you know, CEC and start going through the processes to get that put into place. It's not a. It's it's a timely process. It's a. It's going to take us five or six years just to get something like this off the ground from an organizational standpoint. However, once we get to that point, the sustainability and the and the the structure of that moving forward will land in our control. And uh, ultimately, you know, we've had wins across the state, so we don't have to be at the front of the spear tip on this one. So we can leverage what uh, what's already out there and what's being done, and and try and take some of those applications and bring it in house. Um, but yeah, I, mostly I'm just here to support CCAs as a whole and, uh, and let you know that if uh, any advice is needed to the council, I'm out there and uh, we have, you know, I've been on both sides from the utility side and the private developer side. So uh, thank you for your time and uh, yeah. Well, welcome to the community and thanks for the information. Joanne, no more cards? No. Okay. Could we have a motion to waive reading and full of all resolu resolutions and ordinances? So moved. Second. Motion by Ward, second by Ham. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 3 0. Closed session report, City Attorney. Uh, we just have one item to report. Uh, there was a, a, an item added late last week to the agenda. It was initiation of litigation against. Uh, the operator and property owner of uh, property at 1402 North El Camino Real, uh, that property is being operated as a retail marijuana dispensary, and that violates the, the city's zoning code at, at that location without permits. Uh, so the council authorized us. We, we already sent out a cease and desist order. The council authorized us to bring a civil action against that operator and, and that owner, and we expect to have that done before uh, close of business on Friday. All items listed on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion without discussion unless council staff or the public request removal of an item for separate discussion and action. And I have not received any requests for removal. The public hearing process includes the staff presentation, a presentation by the applicant not to exceed 10 minutes, and public testimony not to exceed three minutes per speaker. Following closure of the public hearing, the City Council will respond to questions raised during the hearing, discuss the issues, and act upon the matter by motion. 
The first public hearing is a continued public hearing to consider an appeal of the Planning Commission's decision of April 18, 2018, approving a large family daycare facility for up to 10 children where a small family daycare community currently operates in an existing townhome located at 3 Paseo Vista. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Council, uh, we assisted the city staff in bringing this uh, application recommendation forward, so I'm not able to sit with the council as a hearing body on it. We had substitute council uh, lined up for tonight, but but something's happened. So I don't think it's going to have legal complications that require lawyers on either side of it. So if it's all right with you, I'll just leave you to your own devices. And if, if we get bogged down on a legal matter, then uh, we'll, we'll recommend that you continue it till, till you can be here. But I think you're going to be fine. All right. Good evening, council members, city manager. My name is Veronica Moronis, assistant planner. This is an appeal of the Rasta Large Family Daycare Conditional Use Permit. The operator currently has a small family daycare at this location, which serves eight children. On April 18th, Planning Commission approved the application to allow an expansion to a large family daycare. The applicant originally requested up to 14 children, but Planning Commission conditioned the project uh, to not exceed 10 children. The applicant agreed to that condition at public hearing. An appeal was filed by Susan Banke. The appeal claims that uh, the application submitted contains misinformation and misleading statements by the applicant, specifically pertaining to fire authority review, CCNRs, um, CEQA analysis, as well as the outdoor play area and ingress and egress of the site. The project site is located at 3 Paseo Vista, which is a condominium residence in the Talega specific plan. Uh, both the zoning ordinance and the Talega specific plan allow for large family daycares through the conditional use permitting process. Staff reviewed the application and determined that the application complies with the zoning ordinance um, and conforms to all requirements and meets the required findings for the conditional use permit. Uh, the staff report correctly states that the CEQA analysis, the CEQA determination is statutorily exempt and the project is still subject to all state licensing review, uh, including fire authority review, subsequent to this approval. Uh, this includes obtaining a new license for the changeover to a large family daycare and should the home not meet the required state licensing, uh, it would be in theory, denied a license by the state. Staff recommends City Council uphold the Planning Commission approval subject to the condition, draft conditions of approval and find the project statutorily exempt from CEQA. Staff's available for questions and the applicant is here for questions as well. Great. Thanks for your report. You have any questions, staff? Yeah. What's their child count now as a small? Currently, eight is the threshold. So we're talking about allowing them to go from eight to ten. Correct. Okay. The letter that you forwarded to us from the applicant, it didn't have a date on it. Was that a letter prior to the Planning Commission meeting where they conditioned it to ten or after? That was prior. That okay. was something submitted Okay, prior. that makes sense. All right, thank you. Questions of staff? We'll hear from the public. Okay. We'll open the public hearing. The first person to speak is uh, Diane Stifel, followed by Diane will be Jurgen Stifel, followed by Jurgen will be Suzanne Shaw, and the final speaker is Navid Hirani. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Um, I know you guys want to do the right thing, and I do too. And um, I don't even think we would be here if there weren't so many misrepresentations on the first application on the Planning Commission. Um, some history, in 2011, they paid cash for this property and signed an agreement that they would not start any kind of business, especially not a business with um, clients coming and going. So three weeks later, they started a business, 2011. So there are 302 owners. About 30 owners have written to the city council asking you please to not approve this. Um, the cost that we've had in our community because of one homeowner wanting to go against all these rules with lawyer fees, time, your time, the planning commission, 
it's been pretty astronomical. Um, I want to tell you that I don't know if any of you live in a condo um, facility, but two doors down, I hear when my neighbor shuts her toilet seat. So I'm thinking if somebody is home, wants to spend the day home doing their work, but not having clients coming in and out, as which they, everybody agreed to in our community, they have a shared wall. So the area that they're in, it's like a horseshoe. Every wall is attached. Why couldn't they be happy with one to eight? In 2011, they never once came to the HOA um, facility, the HOA um, homeowners, and said, hey, we're running a business. They never did it because they would have not been approved. So then they tried to get this through. So we've got 188 residents in a 300-foot radius um, got letters so if you think about how condensed our community is, if Standard Pacific thought that they wanted to allow 10 more cars coming into a condo area four times a day, they would have built and zoned and planned, obviously, another group of condos. So the way we use our community, because we have this business area right next to us, we have a lot of elderly people that don't hear or see well. They are all walking to the store. We have a lot of animals that are walking to the store. And we have children that are in the middle of the street, the residents that live there, riding their bikes, riding their skateboards, not looking day and night because our homes are so small and we share walls. Our children that live in our community must play outside. Why can't they be happy? with one to eight. They made it sound like they're struggling to have a business since 2011 and they can't possibly run an effective business. One to eight is a perfect amount in this community. I'm asking you to please do the right thing for 302 owners. I'm asking you to please not approve this. Thank you, Dan. Jurgen, followed by Jurgen will be Suzanne Shaw. Is it Jurgen? Sorry, my apologies. No problem. My name is Jürgen Stiefel. Good evening. Um, I'm a board member of the HOA of the 302 condo units. And um, it's a con really condensed uh, community. And we had a lot of discussions also with the Rasta family. Uh, they made false information from the very beginning in their application. And uh, I don't know why this never uh, was really came up really with with you guys or also with the planning uh, uh, council it's it's very very weird uh, as uh, it was stated before they 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 have since 2011 a business of a small uh, small child care and uh, you wanted to approve it for 10 children and that seems I think that was your question that seems a little well from 8 to 10 doesn't matter but you have to know the, the license that they will get from the state uh, says 9 to 14. So they can always have 14 with the state and their license. And how do we control this? I mean, there is no way that we can control it if they have more. So and it's how it developed and how, how they, they made false representation in the beginning, I don't know. This is, this is something that really uh, worries me. Uh, I think that's pretty much everything. But I, the, the one thing what I want to ask, why is it that all the time, I'm here now for the fourth time, and I think I was at the uh, planning commission, why is it that the Rasta family's lawyer has the last word all the time? It's very funny to me that we talk first, and then he can listen to everything. I don't know if he even, if he even uh, uh, tapes us. So why is this? This is very weird to me. Thank you. Thank you, Jurgen. Suzanne Shaw, and then following Suzanne will be uh, David Hirani. Thank you. I'm also a property owner in this area, very near to um, where this daycare center is. The owner, as you can see, and with the information that I've sent you um, confirmed at several times that 
the map that is being shown is um, an accurate representation of the property. That's the map that they submitted. Um, the map shows that there's an exit at the rear, house and, uh, rear of the house and also shows that exit extending from the property leading through a gate in the fence and states that this exit leads to a sidewalk that ends up at the street. There is no gate at that location and there is no sidewalk adjoining their property. The actual exit, this is where they show the exit is. The actual exit is at the rear of their side yard that's being used as the only outside play area. That little area is their outside play area. Um, outside the actual exit are trees, shrubs, and trash cans that are actually blocking the exit. This is their second fire exit. They stated that OCFA had inspected the site and had approved it and you've got their written statement of that. It's not true, they were denied. I went to OCFA, they stated that they would not have even gone to the property, so that was incorrect, and that um, they gave me a copy of the requirements. The two main requirements, and council has requested um, that they show some of this information, which they never did in all of your correspondence. They never show the pull fire alarm. They do not have a clear second exit. They submitted a map of the streets showing the available parking. <coughs> the, um, all those blue circles are areas where there is not available parking. And if you read your emails, I sent a couple of pictures this morning that I actually took this morning showing almost every single parking spot was taken during the time that they were gonna have drop off. The um, area adjacent to their property is a steep hill. So there's, to try to take children out, if they could get through the exit, is gonna be nearly impossible. <clears throat> they, um, the information given to the Planning Commission was obviously meant to mislead the Commission and the City Council since they have not given accurate information and can't meet the OCFA's guidelines. I don't see how you can approve a CUP. Thank you. Navid Harani, that's our last card. Uh, good evening. My name is Navid Hayrani. Um, just to clarify a couple things, I'm nobody's attorney. I'm just a private citizen. I'm not representing the Rastas, um, and I'm not taping anybody. I think it's just being taped by itself. Just this background, this has been going on for more than a year, and um, what we are here to discuss is two extra children being added to a daycare that's been operating for more than seven years without any complaints from anybody in the community. I've come to several of these meetings, and um, the appellants have made statements, and we are going to make statements, and what, from what I have come to learn is that we are going to say things, and they are going to say things, and from your position, it can be easy to get caught up in the he said, she said of what is going on here. There is a neutral authority that is objective and has reviewed the facts and has reviewed the law and has applied the law to the facts of our case, and that is the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission has spent hours upon hours reviewing every single nook and cranny of our application and have applied the law to our application. And on numerous occasions, they have come to the conclusion that in all respects, we are compliant with law. That's the end of the story here. Every single aspect of this application has been reviewed. And this process has been going on for so long that it's actually been reviewed by several people in the Planning Commission. The individual who initially reviewed this is not even there anymore. So a new person has now reviewed everything and again has come to the conclusion that this is compliant <coughs> with law. Um, the appellants or the uh, people that performed me came up here and said there were false statements made. They didn't actually prove, uh, provide any evidence or provide any specifics about that. The people who are in charge of determining whether a false statement was made is the Planning Commission who has reviewed that. If they had any issue, they would have told us, and we could have corrected anything. What's happening here is there's been an application submitted by someone who operates a small business 
And that small business is actually providing a very substantial benefit and public policy benefit to the residents of this community. She's not operating a strip club. She's not operating this casino. She's providing a home for children. And her reward for doing it the right way and for just wanting to add two kids, going through this process, complying with every single thing that's been asked of her, is to now be dragged through this rigmarole of months and months of he said, she said. All I'm asking you to do is look at the objective, neutral authority who has reviewed this and take their word for it. You don't have to take mine, and you don't have to take the other side's. You can look at the Planning Commission's reports, who has looked at this and applied the law to it, who has gone to the office every single day and done this, and take their decision. Um, I know I had 10 minutes, but I'm just here for public comment. I think the applicant should have gotten 10 minutes. So that was three minutes. Yeah, so I'll stop when I'm supposed to stop. Thanks for jumping on that. Yeah. Thanks for your comments. Hi. So you are the applicant? So just for clarification, so everyone knows what happened yeah, there. So Real just quick. To clarify. Let, let me clarify what just happened. Right. So Naveed turned in a speaker card. He spoke for two minutes and 50 seconds uh, as a separate speaker speaking in favor of the Rasta's application, but he was not a party to. So now we're going to hear from the applicant, which they're going to introduce themselves and get 10 minutes. So this is my mom. She's the daycare provider who's deathly afraid of public speaking. So she's asked me to speak on her behalf. I own the property. He is not our attorney. He's actually my fiance, and he's also a private citizen, the same way that the two individuals before us who spoke are husband and wife. So he does not represent us in a legal capacity. We're not going to stand up here and attack our neighbors. That's not the focus here. We're not going to get into a he said, she said, because ultimately it's going to look like two kids fighting in a sandbox, and that's not what we're trying to do. The fact of the matter is, is that if you turn your attention to page four of the Planning Commission's report, paragraph four, it says that the application complies with all applicable provisions of the San Clemente Municipal Code. We've been reviewed over and over again by this Planning Commission by two separate individuals. And every time the math adds up to the same solution, that the project should be approved. And it should be approved because it's compliant with the requirements and the city ordinances. These are neutral parties. We didn't hire them on our behalf. The black letter of the law is the ultimate authority here, and we're asking that these facts be taken into account. The state makes the decision about exits. They make the decision about whether or not we have enough fire extinguishers, carbon monoxide detectors, locks on the door, we're not done after this gets approved. The state inspectors and the fire authority have to come in and make those determinations. And no, the fire authority has not denied anything because they're waiting for this CUP decision so that they can move forward, they can do their inspection, and the state inspectors ultimately come in and do those ins inspections in the very end. And they ultimately decide whether or not to give her a license. So it doesn't end here. In terms of well, there's, this is a business and it's causing traffic and parking. The city of San Clemente has issued more than a dozen business licenses to businesses in our community. There are dog walking services. There are printing and shipping businesses. There are at least six real estate agents. There are luxury car dealers, all who work out of their homes in our dense, as they say, community. We're not the only business here. And we're only asking for two more children. And this has led to all of this. We've been in this process since December of 2017. The chair of the Planning Commission came to our community. We didn't know that he did this. He revealed that on the day of the meeting in April. He came on six different occasions for an hour each time during different times of the day. And he observed traffic, parking, and noise. And he determined that there was no issue with traffic there was no issue with parking, and there was no issue with noise. We didn't know he was here, and they didn't know he, he was there. He sh showed up to see for his own eyes in reality what happens every single day, and those were his determinations. Our HOA president isn't here because they dropped their appeal after we had that meeting. The partner of the law firm who represents our HOA had a meeting with us. Mr. Jurgen was there. He was the only board member who was against it. His wife was also here speaking today, as is their right. 
but they were the only, he was the only member of our HOA board who was opposed to it, which was his right, but the majority decided to drop the appeal. The partner of the firm was there, and so was a second lawyer, and they determined that they were not going to pursue it. We are wondering when is enough at this point. We're here to answer your questions. We respect the democratic process, and all those things are true, but ultimately, there's so much red tape that comes into play here because it turns into a he said, she said. We understand we have neighbors and that they have concerns, but the reality is, is that the woman who filed this appeal and the individuals who just spoke live outside of the 300 foot boundary that the city of San Clemente has determined that is required when they send notices out for public hearing. So they have their separate entrances to the community, they have their separate exits, they don't directly clash at all with where we live or where we are. This is not an amusement park. It's not a school. It's two more kids. To the point that this home was paid for in cash, that's irrelevant. To the point that we never came to the HOA because we were somehow doing something shady, that's not true. When you have a license for eight children, you don't need a CUP. But the minute you decide to increase that number, that's when you need one, which is why we're here. And the HOA was always aware that we were running a daycare. We had those conversations through our realtor when we bought that house. Nobody pays however much you pay for a home in cash only to have this run into this problem afterwards. And if businesses were such a problem in our homeowners association, there wouldn't be more than a dozen of them with business licenses with the city right now. There's also a point raised that if you approve the CUP for 10 children, ultimately the state gives us a license for 14. If we were ultimately going to get a license for 14 children, why on God's green earth would we go through this entire process, spend thousands of dollars, because we're paying the city the money and their time that they're spending on this. They're spending a lot of time putting this together, the planning commission, I mean. Why would we go through all of that only to not follow the CUP in the end. How on God's green earth does that make sense? We're asking that the law and the ordinances and ultimately the recommendation of a neutral party be taken into account here. We're not asking for special treatment. We've been to the hearings, we've complied with the rules, down to the very last carbon monoxide detector has been installed. And ultimately, when this, if this CUP goes through, the Orange County Fire Authority needs to come by. They need to do their full-on inspection. And as I mentioned, the state comes and does theirs. This process doesn't end today. We're asking for this to be looked at from an objective point of view. And it, sometimes it's difficult to see that when you have so much noise in the background from people who are presenting information that's just not true. If it wasn't true the first time, someone would have caught it the second time. We're here to answer your questions. We understand that there's a time limit. We can't just call out or shout out, and all those things are fine, and we agree with that. But we're asking for you to at least ask us if you have a question, because nobody knows this application better than we do. And it's been many months. It's been a lot of work and a lot of time. We want to thank the Planning Commission for all the effort that they've, all the research they've put into this outside of us to try and fully make sure that all of these uh, are compliant. Finally, with parking and, and issues of, of the HOA, the HOA had a private meeting with us, as I mentioned, with their attorneys. They decided to withdraw their appeal. And they've determined with us that in terms of any issue that they may have, that their attorneys would be in direct contact with us. So at this point, it becomes a matter of neighbor versus HOA, and it's unfortunate that the council of a major city in Orange County is now getting dragged into an issue between neighbors and their homeowners association. That's also another part of it, the way that we see it. We're happy to answer any questions if, if you have any. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions of the applicant? I have a quick question. When you first opened up, did you contact your neighbors and, and sh tell them what you're doing and come up with some uh, parking instruction for your, for your, wait, let me finish, 
for your parents that you could share with, with your neighbors that they knew how the drop-off drop was going to go? Did you, did you do that? Yes. The answer to that question is yes. Okay. So explain to me how you, do your, how you instruct your parents on the drop-off. So the parents are all, they go through sort of, I guess it's an orientation type thing before they bring their children. And my mom goes through, of course, all the state requirements, you know, the typical, the vaccines that the children need to have, everything that you would imagine when you take your child to school, for example. The state requirements are very similar to that. Then she does sort of a walkthrough and shows them where they're allowed to park, goes over the speed limit. We've had issues in our homeowners association with rideshare apps and Uber and these types of things where people are kind of speeding on the roads. That's been a concern. She goes over speed limit requirements with them. She goes over where to park. They're not allowed to park in the air. There's a, there's a designated area for residents, which is kind of like, you know, like in the driveway almost. And then the parking on the street is separate. So they're instructed to not park in resident parking. So in other words, along the street. Um, and that's the way that they are told how to do it. And I mean, these parents are Telego residents. I mean, they're familiar with, you know, I mean, there's a speed limit. You can't just speed on the road. Um, some people walk, which is another point that we wanted to bring up, is a lot of these families walk because they live in that same area. Um, and so they, they'll just walk and bring their kids. There's no issue with cars. Some of these families have multiple children in, in one family who are enrolled in the daycare. So... When we say 10 kids, it's not really 10 kids every day. I mean, yesterday she had three. So, you know, it's just to give her more flexibility. And some of these parents, like I said, have two or three kids who are part of the same family. And that's the way that, that they do that. What drove you to want to increase it? Because what I saw in, in the report was that you had to turn people away. That's Is right. Is that the only reason? Yes. There's a need for it in our community. It's just to grow. I mean, San Clemente has been so wonderful. It, it's also been growing. So she's had. Plus, sometime, like, one of the mom has, like, ex, like I have a extra emergency or something. I want to have it, but I want to do it by a rule. I don't want to take, you know, one more because my license. That's why I want to do it. Like, I have flexibility, but that's why I did Honestly, if I was thinking about this going to be that, you know, headache, I was like, I didn't, I want to do the right way. I don't want to, you know what I mean? So she, in other words, it's the flexibility of knowing that you can, you know, if a parent needs to drive, I mean, she's had parents where she's like, look, I can only take one of your children, not the other one. I don't have space for the other one. You know, it's, it's, this is not a corporate machine. It's a very personal, family-oriented environment. And these parents become family to us as well. Their kids, to a certain age, think that my mom is their mom when they're young. And so, you know, the parents build these bonds with her, and they say, look, you know, we're, we want to have a second kid. Are you going to be able to, you know, care for our child? And she'll say, look, I, I don't have space. It was coming from that place, because ultimately, two more kids doesn't make a huge financial difference. It's not about the finances. It's about the flexibility. Did somebody live full-time with the residents, one of the three of you? Okay. As long as that's all I need to know. Thank yeah. you. No questions for that. Okay. Thank no you. questions? Yeah. I do have some questions of staff, though, just to follow up on what some of the speakers spoke of. So, Veronica, if you could step up. So I'm just going to go down the list here, and hopefully we can address all the concerns. Um, the first concern I heard was that uh, the state's going to give them a permit for 14. How do we control that and ensure that it's only 10? So if the state issues a license and they cap it at 14, they still have the entitlement of the conditional use permit, which is what the city requires in order for the use to operate. And if they were to violate their CUP, then their CUP would be void. And that So would... a, somebody who lives in the community could call code enforcement just like they would for any other issue? Correct. Okay. Um, someone mentioned some exit concerns. Were exits addressed by staff when, when exits are not a part of our zoning ordinance review? They're an OCFA. Okay. Perfect. Uh, one of the issues that I have, and you know, we, we don't get a lot of uh, business licenses, home business licenses coming to council, but I do know one of the issues that staff looks at is traffic concerns. So explain to me at what point traffic would be too large, and staff would say, you know, we're not going to allow this type of business in a residential zone. 
So as the applicant stated, General's I wasn't the original planner on this project. And so from the records and the file itself, the project did go through our development management team review, which includes our engineering division. And from that review, engineering determined, as far as I can tell in the record, that there were no traffic concerns. There was ample parking shown. The parking drop-off plan was sufficient. There are conditions of approval that limit the drop-off time to a specific amount. Um, and that was used to mitigate for traffic. Okay. And how many complaints, if any, have we received for this business? Regarding the project itself, there have been several complaints in the ballpark of around six or seven. But code enforcement complaints for the use since 2011 are zero. Clarify for me, what do you mean six or seven complaints for the project? Public comments public, opposing public comments. the project, okay. correct. Got it, got it. Okay. Um, that's my only, only questions I have with staff. I was going to address one more concern no, from... No, I won't. Okay, perfect. So, um, <clears throat> now I happen to live in an HOA. So, you know, and I used to be president of it. So I'm familiar with HOA operations. And uh, in my HOA and, and where I live... We do have some people that run some businesses out of their, their homes, but they had to get HOA approval and submit them to the city uh, for their licensing. And the, the city wanted to have a copy of the HOA approval in order to extend uh, the CUP or, or, or the business license. I'm not hearing that we've required that in this procedure. So I see no HOA approval on this additional increase. Um, I do see notice of an HOA approval back on December 2017. Was it a written approval, and do we have a copy of it? So there was an email provided by the applicant from the HOA that said there was no specific issue. It should be an attachment in your report. Um, and additionally, Title 17, which is the zoning ordinance, doesn't have a stipulation for discretionary review requiring homeowner approval. Um, we typically, staff will ask for homeowner approval and to show good faith that they have checked and to make sure they don't run into issues later down the line, like obtaining a conditional use permit and then have their HOA deny them. Because yeah, most HOAs, it's, it's a violation of the HOA to do business in their residential area unless they get a specific approval from the HOA to do so. So, and I uh, don't want to put this city nor this council in between an HOA and a resident battle. Um, but on top of that, this wasn't black or white, black and white. Uh, this was a 4-3 vote. So, and you had the, the chair vote for it and the chair pro tem vote against it. So, so you know, this is an, an issue that I don't think is overwhelming in one direction or another. Me, I would like to see, uh, push it back to planning um, and tell planning to require them to get the HOA to sign off on this. And if the HOA signs off on it and if the planning still supports it, I don't see any reason for our council to do anything about it. Uh, but I, I don't want to make a decision in the middle of this and end up in a battle. So. Yeah, Mayor Hammy, if I may uh, interject for a second. There are uses in your code that may require HOA approval prior to the city processing those applications, but for child care care facilities, there is not a requirement that um, the applicant first uh, run it by the HOA. Um, I, I can't explain to you why in this particular instance, but I do have a sense of why. Both state law and your municipal code uh, indicates that it wants to promote, you know, daycare center in a home environment as opposed to a corporate or institutional environment. In fact, your daycare facilities are uh, listed as public institutional uses. They're not listed as commercial uses in your code. Um, but both, again, state law and your code uh, seems to promote these types of uses uh, in, in homes. That helps. Thanks. Okay. So I'm glad you pointed that out. It wasn't clear. It wasn't a clear consensus on the Planning Commission. They had issues of not being able to make all the findings. And when we do a CUP like this, we have to make the findings that this would not impact 
uh, the surrounding area. With the home occupation permits, what we've been doing, we're usually very concerned about cars and deliveries coming in and out. In a daycare, what you see is is there's a pickup, a drop off, and a pickup twice a day. So, and it's it's a lot of it's a lot of traffic. What I'm inclined to do, all these conditions and what the planning commission found, there was no complaints on the one to eight, on the existing. So it seems to be working. I'm just not sure I can make the findings that anything over, any child over eight, a large daycare that I think is appropriate for this small of an area. I, I, I understand that it's family oriented. That's why we want these family daycares. But I think the one to eight and where they're at is adequate. And I'm not going to be able to approve uh, over that. I just, I, I can't make the findings either. And I think we have to finally settle this. I think the applicant was the one that asked for a couple of these continuances, so it's not just the city process that slowed them up. Um, I, I just think we have to draw a line on it with what I see that they have. I think uh, they've been doing a good job at the one to eight. So that's going to be my position. Okay. So I heard both of uh, council's concerns. Let me just address some more concerns I heard from the audience before we continue with our subject discussion here. The final one I got written down here is uh, why does the Rasta family get the last word? Um, so I can tell you from uh, six years of experience listening to public hearings up here, if we do in other orders, we'd be here until the cows come home, which we don't have any cows in San Clemente anymore, so it'd be a long time. So that's why we do it in the order we do it in. It gives everybody an opportunity to speak, and we give an opportunity for the applicant as well as staff to come back and uh, rebut or confirm what comments have been made. So um, it's not out of any bias. It's just the way that... Uh, it's done to be most efficient. So uh, I ripped out a section here, uh, attachment six. It's 918187832 uh, to Mr. Schwartz's concerns. And it's uh, the HOA legal team approving, having no objection to this. So that alleviates his concern. Before I uh, go down my spiel, I'd just like to say uh, a couple words on behalf of the applicant and say thank you for your patience on this, um, as well as the residents of the community. Thank you for your patience as well. Um, everybody has an opportunity to speak. That's one of the beauties of living in the city of San Clemente is we have a process, and sometimes that process lasts longer than we'd like it to, but it gives everybody an opportunity to say their piece. Um, Kathy, I'm hopeful that uh, I can sway your opinion here as we speak. I'm, I, I'm leaning towards what Steve said. Two is not a huge jump. We've had zero complaints in the last six years. Uh, I myself lived across the street from a large daycare for many years uh, in a condo, and you know what? I didn't have any issues with it. Um, had this been a subject property where we had multiple nuisance calls, we had uh, issues, we had these people saying that, you know, for the last six years this has been a nightmare, I'd share a lot of your same concerns. Um, I'm not hearing that from the public. I'm not hearing that from staff. Uh, quite frankly, two is a pretty small number, and I understand what the applicant says in terms of having flexibility. Um, I'm inclined to approve it this evening. I'd hate to see this get jumped down the road again. Um, I know that there's been circumstances that led to this, but it seems to me it's been long enough. We approve the two children, and we move on with everybody's day. I'm concerned that we cannot enforce the two. Mm -hmm. And, yes, they would have their CUP revoked, but it would take the people around them having to count and make a case. Mm -hmm. And I know what that takes to do. Uh, so I'm inclined to not give a CUP that would lessen what a state permit would do. I think we're, I think we're trying. The planning commission only approved it on that basis, pretty much, that it would only they'd condition it. So when the state doesn't do that and say it's only ten, I think we're we're going beyond what we should be doing. So I guess my only comment to that, Kathy, would be that the, just the mere fact that they've come to every single one of these hearings, they said they've come, they would come to, to get to, lends me to the, believe the fact that. A complete and a face value and that they're only going to do two. They're not going to risk their license um, to go above and beyond or to be a horrible neighbor. I mean, they've already created waves within the community in the past nine months. Um, I guess I can make it real simple and ask our legal team, put his mind to work and say, is two to one get us anywhere or does it need to be three zeros being that we only have three people here this evening? The state law requires that for a resolution, you need minimum three votes of the council. Got it. So I'll so, continue talking to try to convince you of why this is such well, a great let me idea, ask, Kathy. Let me ask a couple of questions of staff then. What further conditions could we do to condition this approval if we added two more 
that would help with uh, with noise and um, the added cars coming because it may not be the same family coming so when staff reviewed the application, they didn't find that any noise impacts would be generated. There is a condition of approval that limits the amount of children that can be outdoors at one time, so that is a mitigation. Additionally, as I stated earlier, the, the parking and drop-off plan elicits only 15-minute blocks for drop-off and pickup. Um, so there, there were measures implemented by the previous staff planner and development management team to account for that. One thing I noticed that other cities had in their family daycare is they don't uh, allow parents to park on the opposite side of the street because they're walking kids across the street. I think our, ours is silent on that, is it not? Well, there is there. no regulation for that. Okay. So that was one of the concerns that I had uh, also. Um, let me interrupt you for one second. I'm a little rusty at this job, so okay. uh, Joanne's leading me here. I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank so. you. Continue. So I'm just trying to – I'm concerned that there's 10. Can, can – could the city council, if they approve 10, could we make any comments to the state uh, about this or learn anything about this? Because to me, this is a small area for 10 children. And I know it's not in our purview, but because it's so small, I'm not sure it warrants a large daycare. You know, it meets the requirements. So the state is the one that's going to have to go through that, right, and, and see what the square footage is and, and all of that in the, in the side yard. The, the does, does, the state re, does the state get a copy of the CUP when they, for the licensing? I don't know if they do require a copy of the CUP. Um, they will measure or a review for required items under state law. So I'm concerned that giving that is going to make the state approve something that they wouldn't normally approve. So here's the only thing I will say, Kathy, is that um, you know we, we've heard from public comment this evening people that are adamantly opposed to it. As mentioned by one of the speakers, we've gotten multiple emails from different people. We had a resident put up their own money to appeal this process after the appeal was withdrawn from the HOA. We're going to have very active members of the community that are going to be ensuring that this business adheres to the rules set forth. We saw pictures, diagrams, emergency exits. We saw all this stuff just in preparation for an application. All right. One last thing. Could the, could the CUP be conditioned to where it, we have a review if we do have complaints that we can knock it back down to eight? Is that, is that a, a, yes. a hard process? Yes. Can, you can actually require, I mean, you can issue a permit with a six-month report back to council. You know, so you can do a, you know, again, conditional use permit. You can condition it to, for staff to bring it back in six months, one year. Um, While we're talking about conditions. Yes. What about a, con a condition including the fact that they have to have the property actual condition match what they submitted? As far as so the you gates can, and locations you can also, and all that. Yes, you can, you can require an added condition that they provide a copy of the resolution of the city council to the state and to specify in their application to the state that, that they want 10. These plan, but these plans that were submitted are how the property is to look. In other words, where they show a gate yeah. located, access, egress, emergency exits, everything as shown in what was submitted to us is what physically has to be on the property. You, you, can, you can add that condition. Um, okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure that it makes much difference because... Well, we have the, the primary contention I heard at the most is, well, they lie because everything that they're showing here doesn't exist. Yeah. That there is no fence here, there is, or there's no gate here, there's no way they can get there. They got trash cans blocked and everything. Yeah. So I'm saying, fine, match what you've submitted yeah, the, the issue with that, though, you know, and I would recommend against that because the California Building Codes, and in this case a fire code, uh, would also be applicable in this situation. And those codes can change every three years. And to the extent that the OCFA, that the state or the building department, you know, identifies uh, better ways to provide safety for the residents and the occupants of the structure, uh, you want to give the building official and the fire authority the authority to uh, 
you know, change the requirements to provide higher safety than what you, the information you have before you Okay, today. so what if I adjusted to that they, they have, OCFA has to, has to give a, a complete solid a recommendation and, a, and uh, sign off on, on its conditions and health, and that needs to be turned in to staff uh, before any uh, CUP is issued. Well, the CUP will be issued, but you can condition the CUP to to the to, then has to be turned to, in to, to satisfactory com compliance staff. with the you know to the building and fire codes. Okay, All right. I can maybe live with that. I think is uh, as long as we have another set of eyes looking at what's going on and, and we get signed off by OCFA that that everything safety wise and emergency exits and everything else are would work and are fit and are up to code and there's no safety issues um, uh, then I would probably support passing okay. that with a one-year review Kathy would that be I don't even know if it needs a review I think it's just if there's recorded complaints that it gets pulled up for review I mean, I don't know if that's a standard thing that we have. I just, I want it in there. I have complaints are verifiable complaints. That's what I'm saying is verifiable. And that's, that might be the issue. And if we don't get any, maybe just we do it one year and we look at if there isn't any, we just move on with it. But I think verifiable, I mean, that's going to so, be the issue. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to keep this thing going past this evening. So in order to get a resolution or what if we do a three strikes rule just like we've done with vacation rentals well that's what i was going to ask is what would be our how would cecilia we, you come how would that? we uh, go through a process like that because uh, we've just been changing our codes a lot to where we have set rules cecilia garrido daily community development director if um there was um, a determination after a complaint and an investigation that a condition of approval of a um, CUP, for example, was being violated, we have the ability to take um, the permittee through the revocation hearing process to revoke the conditional use permit. And that's on one infraction? Yes, yes. Any okay. violation of their conditions of approval, and we, already we can have revoke that in the place. CUP. Yes. Okay. So then I guess I would just state that with the CUP, you know, we would like that, that uh, the fire authority um, verify the safety that we're concerned about the exits. Just yeah, so and I want it to be submitted concerns. to staff, and I want them to review it so that they are comfortable with what the OCFA says. Right, but I think OCFA will not come until we issue the CUP. Yeah, right. So I once understand. we issue it, staff will see it. If it doesn't meet it, then that then we would, want could them be, to bring it back. We do want it to bring back. And if you note, condition of approval number 11 states that if any of the reviewing authorities over the city deny the permit, then the CUP is void. Perfect. All right. Okay. So and I'll uh, go with that. I just want to, that's, I want my concern on the record. Okay. With that, I move that we adopt resolution 1851 title resolution of the City Council of the City of San Clemente, California, approving conditional use permit 2017-390 Ross, the large family daycare. Request to allow a large family daycare for up to 10 children under the age of six at 3 Paseo Vista. That's it. Motion. Second. Second by Swartz. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 3-0. Thank you for your patience on both sides. Next is a public hearing concerning the 2017-2018 Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report, CAPER, for submittal to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the Council, uh, Cecilia Gardo daly Community Development Director. Um, this is the annual review and approval of the CAPER report, which summarizes um, the city's expenditure, expenditures and accomplishments for the CDBG program for fiscal year 17 and 18. Um, the CAPER requires a uh, public hearing and a 15-day notice period to allow the public to submit comments in writing. Um, the... Um, CAPER that's attached to the staff report uh, just summarizes how the city spent the CDBG funds um, throughout this last fiscal year on housing rehab, commercial rehab, public improvements, and public services. Okay. That concludes the staff report, and I'm available for any questions. If there's no questions, I'm going to make a motion. Okay. First, oh, 
Well, do we have any cards, Joanne? No. Closed. Uh, I move that we want to approve and authorize the mayor to execute contract C18-52, the Small Enterprise Agreement County Municipality Government with Environmental Systems Research Institute, ESRI, to authorize payment to environmental systems. Am I reading the wrong one? Yeah. Did I jump ahead? Oh, I jump back, not ahead. Uh, let's do that again. Uh, I'm going to amend my motion to read as follows. Approve and adopt the 2017-18 Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation caper for submittal to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Second. Motion by Am, second by Swartz. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 3-0. Thanks for staff for catching that. Staff is a great report. It's really nice. Thank you. Oral communications part two. I did not receive any requests to speak. Oh. I miss you, Machete. City manager. City attorney. Uh, yeah, mayor and council, there have been a couple issues come up about how we're operating uh, the city's review of Public Records Act requests. And if I just want to report for a minute on that, if that's okay. It's an important facet of our new contract with the city. Um, uh, just PowerPoint, Laura, maybe that's all right. Well, we'll just do that. Um, as, as the council is aware, uh, if we can just go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, the Public Records Act is always involves a balancing between government in the sunshine, uh, public awareness, and public outreach, and disclosure of the public's business. But as against the government in the sunshine goals, there are also interests relating to privacy and confidentiality. And uh, where it's been suggested in this forum that the city can just make all its records available, to the public under any circumstances. Uh, we do need, with, with staff's help, to go really through every record that people want to look at to uh, look at concerns relating to individual privacy. Uh, once had a, a city client inadvertently release contact information uh, for a single parent uh, that violated a temporary restraining and protective order for her. And so she was quite upset that that number and that contact information and her address were released to the public. So there's uh, confidential and individual private matters that, that need to be protected. A lot of the work, especially in uh, planning and community development, is the work product of architects and engineers. Um, the city's not permitted to simply photocopy or photograph their work product and, and hand it out to third parties, probably for obvious reasons. Uh, there are trade secrets. The city often receives uh, requests for uh, sprinklers or, or other contracts, sidewalk repairs. Uh, those are often businesses looking to poach the customer list of other businesses that we have on file. We're not supposed to release customer lists. Um, and then uh, information relating to informants. We actually have a records request pending right now where the requester wants to get hold of um, information the records that contain a lot of information about an, an informant. Um, Attorney-client communications, Laura, if you could show the next slide. Uh, as late as last year, in a case decided against the city of Los Angeles, the California Supreme Court recognized the right of a city council to uh, confer freely and confidentially with its lawyers. And so we consider that right to belong to the city as a corporation, and we, we preserve it zealously, as do you. Uh, the next slide. Um, as the councils mentioned, there's uh, an evolution in the law lately, a lot of it that complicates uh, the city's ability to respond to these requests. As you know, as you know personally, uh, the law now makes your private emails available to the public. Uh, that's a, a little bit complicated to implement. Uh, if the city inadvertently waives privileges, then all records relating to confidentiality have to be um, have to be released. That was that Alec case. And then finally, um, there's there are some cities that actually pre-screen and pre-code every city document as it relates to privacy, as it relates to attorney-client privilege. Uh, these are referred to as sunshine cities because every employee uh, codes every document and then hits it over the net to the public side of the firewall. Uh, your city has, has considered doing this, and, and as you can see, and as I can read from your faces, that cost would be extreme uh, in San Clemente's case. 
Uh, we did a little internal work on this because um, we sensed that, that the demand for these services was growing across our client base. This is from our firm. Uh, the most significant line is that last one that shows an increase in billable hours from 365 in 2014 to 400% that time, and uh, that's going to be higher this year than that. Uh, the next slide shows the hit on San Clemente, which should be of most interest to us here. Uh, this includes attorney's costs and our estimate of staff time, but your responses to Public Record Act requests and demands in 2017-18 was about $225,000. Uh, just July alone of this fiscal year was $27,000. When you project that out, uh, that would be $324,000 this fiscal year, which is clearly unacceptable. The vast, vast majority of that time is spent in responding to fewer than 10 requesters. We have frequent flyers who are um, the, the bulk of that demand by far and above the remainder of the public put together. Uh, here are some um, examples of, of our frequent flyers requests. Uh, there was 10 requests of multiple items that took 132.7 hours. That request was so broad that there were 20,000 hits on the city's IT system. Uh, recently, we, was, uh, we received 12 requests that when you broke them down involved 78 subparts and searches. Uh, three requests that took 45 hours, 15 in July of 2018 alone. Uh, here's the one I mentioned earlier. All me emails to or from the city council and or the city manager and anyone they wrote for a fixed period. That was uh, 20,000 hits. That request refused to, to narrow the scope of that at all. So we had to go through every email to and from. Uh, our firm um, has been working with our uh, 46 other client cities and some that uses just for this purpose to create an advanced record center. Uh, what it does, uh, first and foremost here, is carve out a specific segment of the budget. You, know, you did that in approving an amendment to our retainer last month where we are going to allocate $5,000 a month to this, which is a lot, but parse it out to people in, in fair shares so that that effort is available to a larger segment of the public and, and, and it won't cost 300 and something thousand dollars. Uh, we're trying to assign lawyers and paralegals and staff on the city side with the capability and experience to do this so they know what they're doing. That creates efficiency. We've taken our electronic discovery staff and trained them how to do Public Records Act requests. So now they can not only do litigation and manage those cases, but also these requests. And then we've cross-integrated with cross-access to city IT, the city clerk, and your records specialist. Um, we're rolling this out and expanding it to, to other clients for economies of scale so that um, it, it costs less per, per unit than somebody just starting over every time. I think that's the last slide. But I wanted to, to present that to you. It, it's come up here. It was part of, of what we scoped with you and uh, the city manager's office in rethinking our budget, and especially as it relates to the 1819 fiscal year. That's the end of my report. Second reading? No. no. New business? Okay. The, the de this is the downtown sidewalk cleaning item. Got it. Okay. The mayor, I might have something after that. Yeah. Mickey, you want to speak? Do you want to hear the staff's report first, or would you like to speak? It's Whatever up to you. I think we all know what the staff report's going to say, so I think we're good without a staff report. We'll just go straight to uh, oral comm. Before, before we move on, I just want to be clear uh, that previously the budget for this was $18,000. We talked about budgeting out of council contingency. Uh, staff has been uh, obtaining bids uh, for this project. And right now, the lowest responsible bid is twenty-six thousand dollars. Okay. Thanks There's still money in council contingency, but I just want to be upfront with that. Mickey, good to see you. Sidewalk cleaning. 
Wayne. Thank you, Council. Um, I'm Mickey Rathman, here tonight representing uh, the Downtown Business Association. Um, as a group, we are very grateful for the support that we receive um, from the City of San Clemente and our current Council in uh, supporting the DBA's activities um, and events. Um, we also understand that there are ordinances that require business owners to uh, maintain and take care of the sidewalks um, in front of their businesses. That being said, um, street cleaning is really important. Um, one of the most treasured areas of our community is our downtown, is our T-zone, um, and it's really embarrassing how dirty it is. Uh, business owners want to comply, want to help, um, but it's difficult. It's scary. We get all, you know, sorts of in trouble. You're not allowed to use water. You can't have any waste water run into the um, gutters because it goes to the ocean. So people don't know what to do. Business owners are stymied and frustrated um, because they want it to be clean, um, but we need help. Um, the city in the past, um, and even currently still listed on your website, um, is that the city cleans it twice a year, once at the beginning of the summer and again um, in July after our annual um, street fiesta. Um, it, it's amazing to me that it would cost uh, the amount of money that it does, um, but it gets dirty. There's gum, there's you know foot traffic. We have these amazing, beautiful pavers, um, and there's little cracks and stuff gets in there, and it needs to be professionally cleaned in a way um, that meets our clean ocean requirements. And with business owners, um, the number of them that we have and the number that we have that live out of state, it's really difficult to coordinate that and have it be something that's um, um, consistent and that all areas look good and are a good representation um, of our beautiful town. Um, so we are asking um, for the city's help um, with some cleaning um, or some additional advice on how we can participate and do it in a way that meets the rules. Thank you. Thanks, Mickey. Wayne, that's our final speaker. Thank you, Wayne. Next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wayne Eggleston, San Clemente. I'm here to support the small businesses downtown uh, and in uh, the T-Zone and on, in uh, the downtown area. As James knows, for the last three or four years, I've been um, talking about keeping our sidewalks clean down there. They are disgusting. Um, the, um, after the fiesta, for example, I sent, I should have sent pictures in because uh, we had dinner uh, at, uh, down there and uh, walking along the sidewalk, uh, we noticed around a trash container cockroaches. Um, it was just disgusting. Uh, and in the, on the sidewalk, you can't even see the color of the sidewalks anymore in certain areas. It's black. By the, by the, in front of the community center, it's black. Across the street from the post office, it's black. Right now, we have 10 restaurants in South El Camino and the uh, 100 and 200 block. It's disgusting. It, this is a basic um, maintenance of our infrastructure. We're not building something here. It's basic maintenance of our infrastructure. Uh, and it's important that we keep it clean. Uh, even if you did it twice a year, once after the fiesta and once in the, at the beginning of the summer or something of that nature or the spring, I can't imagine it's costing that much. And for uh, the merchants to do this on their own, the, it would just be inconsistent and it's just, uh, that doesn't work. Now, when you go to Europe, you see merchants out there cleaning the sidewalk every day, hosing it down. We can't do that here because of the water quality board. So it's important that the city provides basic maintenance of our infrastructure, which is sidewalks down there. I'd like to find out what, what $26,000 entails, how many times a year, and what portion are they going to be cleaning. Also, down at the Pier Bowl, um, the, the uh, sidewalk, in part of the sidewalk, there's also black. So it's not just downtown and the T-zone. It's also down at the pier. It really is bad, terrible. We need to we need to spruce it up. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, Mr. Bonnegat, can you step to the front, please? So, uh, how you ended up with this, I'm not sure, but you're going to take the brunt of it. So, uh, 
Before we start here, I want to just review a couple of things with council and with staff. So I think it was last year we adopted a policy that said every business needs to maintain within 500 feet of their property any trash or debris left over from said business. Whatever it takes, and I know it's, that's why I said it's strange that you're here, but can you reach out to the appropriate staff member to ensure that we're actually enforcing that regulation? Probably Adam, I would imagine. I will, yes. Um, just remind them of that, and maybe we can do an initial um, surge in reminding businesses that this is an ordinance that we can cite. Um, there's a few businesses in town that we all know that uh, create more of a nuisance than the rest, um, and hopefully just, you know, a quick blast would get them back on board to doing their own facilities maintenance. The second one, Steve, before I get off the podium here, is uh, I'm not going to ask that we implement it right now because I, I'm guessing one person's not going to be happy with implementing it, but we bring back uh, for the Fiesta part of the business licensing agreement and permitting is that they cover the cost for cleanup after their event. So, um, good idea. Oh, can I, I, add got, to, I got Steve's support. Can I just add to that one point really sure. quick? Sure. Just that one point. Uh, we do need to review the Fiesta. It just seems like this year uh, it was worse than normal. It almost looked like someone just put barbecue sauce all over everything. And so maybe there needs to be some things of, of code of conduct and, and controlling what you have and picking it up. I don't know. But if they just assume that we're going to clean it after, they, they can't have carte blanche to just make a mess. Yeah, and it's not unusual to have deposits or have money posted to cover the cleanup costs. Um, the bid specs on on the or the bid the bids that were that came in on it that went from eighteen thousand estimate to twenty six thousand. Uh, do you know how many bidders we had on that? Two so far. Yeah. And was that uh, for a one time or was it like an annual contract? It was to mimic the service that we had been providing, which was twice a year cleaning in the area that I described in your report, which is more than just the T-zone. It's El Camino Real from Presidio to Palazada, Del Mar from El Camino Real to Avenida Victoria, then in the Pier Bowl, Avenida Victoria uh, up to the Beachcomber, and then we also added in um, an option to do this segment in front of the Senior Center because we were aware of some recent concerns about the cleanliness at that entrance uh, right, twice so a year. We're, we're talking about an awful lot more uh, of lineage than uh, uh, or acreage than, than what just the, the T-zone area. That's correct. Um, and the 26,000 covers the cleaning at least twice. Twice uh, yearly. In That's a year. correct. So at the, the 18,000 estimate that we originally worked on, was that in thinking it was going to be an annual basis or was it thinking one time? So we, we figured by annual. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to be supportive with that. I'm going to move that uh, we direct staff to continue with the bids and uh, award a contract or if it needs to come back to us with consent, whatever the next step in the process would be, and that we uh, remind Adam and his code enforcement officers that businesses need to clean up 500 feet within their business and then that we take a look at our activities permit for the chamber for next Fiesta to ensure that they're paying their fair share of street cleanup. Before I second it, I'd like to add to that. Um, that should our bid still come in so high, there's two things that we need to give to the business community. One is if they can't wash it down, but they they have these old inventions. If you're gonna uh, say broom, I'm gonna die. They're called a broom. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they can sweep up in front, and the more the cleaner they keep the areas in front, the less expensive it is for us to do the major cleaning. So that would keep our costs down. And when we come back with the final bids, we may talk, want to talk about the overage between 18000 to whoever they end up with, and maybe we'll work out a deal where we can share the cost with the business community for the increase. We're going to cover the eighteen grand, but we may want to be looking. To, there might be a way to work on sharing some of that additional cost on the initial big cleanup so that we, get, we finally get that sidewall looking like it's supposed to look. So I am supporting it but I'm just caveat on it that, that we may want to look at these other additional parts to it. Clear as mud, Tom? Clear, yes, sir. Thank you. Joanne, we don't have to read the account or anything. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. 
Okay. Second readings? Yes, sir. Oh, I see that you guys got this all messed up. Uh, yeah, I do. I have council member items that I want to bring up since no one else wanted to. I know, but I came back. So, Oh, Kathy's got something? Oh, okay. Well, we're going to go straight to me. So there's two things I want to bring up. The first one is that uh, I got to meet the Commandant of the Marine Corps uh, last week. I went in uh, place of the mayor because he was out of the country. And so this is the Commandant of the Marine Corps. He's the guy in charge. He's a four-star general, Mr. Neller. Uh, he's a great guy. I was there on behalf of the city for the uh, Incheon Landing 68th anniversary, and I got to sit with some pretty incredible uh, Korean War veterans that had some amazing stories and that served this country very well. Very humbling experience. It was uh, fun to meet this individual and sit down with the general and discuss some things that are going on at the base, but I thought I'd share that and say thanks, Tim, for... Let me step in your place. The second item I want to bring up is, I'm a little ashamed to say it's the first time I ever went to the Cabrillo Playhouse, but I went for their comedy night, and it was amazing. So uh, they have the best deal on drinks in town, in case nobody knows. They're free. They just want a donation. <laughs> so uh, I'm surprised it wasn't more packed. Um, sold out night. We had a ton of fun, and i definitely going to be going to more Cabrillo Playhouse evenings. So that's my two cents. Okay, I have one item. As you know, uh, we've looked at and we've done staff reports for historical districts, possibly uh, downtown and North Beach. Uh, all I'm asking for tonight is that council directs staff to come back with uh, some type of a management plan of what it would take to implement those. So staff would come back with whatever look at our reports, whatever needs to be done, how much time it would take, what, how they reach out to the public. That's what I'm asking for tonight. So we initiate that. Do you need anything more, Joanne? Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Okay. So everybody done? Okay. So um, we're asked, requesting uh, the second reading of Ordinance 1663 which prohibits possession of open containers of alcohol in public places. So if someone would like to make the motion and read the title. So I move that we adopt, oh, read the title too. So this to. title is Ordinance Number 1663, Prohibiting Possession of Open Containers of Alcohol in Public Spaces. I move that we adopt Ordinance Number 1663 in town orders of the City Council of the City of San Quentin, California, amending the San Quentin Municipal Code, Chapter 9.04, to prohibit possession of open containers of alcohol in public spaces. Motion by Ham, second by Ward. All those in favor? Aye. Passes 3-0. Second is uh, move that we adopt Ordinance Number 1664, removing language relating to status crimes and to consolidate provisions regarding penalties and administrative fines. And that's to adopt Ordinance Number 1664 entitled an Ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Quentin, California, amending the San Quentin Municipal Code to remove language relating to the status crimes and to consolidate provisions regarding penalties and administrative fines. Second. Second by Swartz. All those in favor? Aye. Passes 3-0. And with that, I move that we adjourn to the next regular council meeting, which will be held on, every time this gets me, the next regular council meeting will be held on Tuesday, October 2nd, 2018, in the council chambers located at 100 Avenue Presidio, San Quentin, California. Closed session items will be considered at 5 p.m. The regular business meeting will commence at 6 p.m.